Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is entitled, How to Interpret Scripture. That would be a pretty important topic, I would think. This is lesson number five in that series from May 2 of 2020, um, entitled, By Scripture Alone, Dash Sola Scriptura for all you Latin enthusiasts. And it's going to be an interesting one, I can tell you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we recognize your presence, first of all, this, e this day and as we study together uh, your word. Help us to know how we can interpret what's here and uh, know how to apply it to our discussion and to the, our lives uh, in the future as we seek to interpret Scripture is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know whether you've heard it, maybe not, but uh, there's no question about the fact that the rousing cry of the Protestant Reformation was Scripture alone, or as it was in Latin in those days, sola scriptura. Thus, Protestants were rejecting the traditions which the Roman Catholic Church had added and which were often superseded in their opinion, uh, superseded in their opinion, the importance of Scripture itself. Often in those days, priests gave allegorical interpretations of Scripture that had no obvious connection to the text as read from the Bible. So Protestant, of course, they were reading a language that not many people could even understand in those days. So Protestant reformers insisted that the text should be read to mean what the words obviously seem to imply in ordinary language. Wow, that's kind of a stiff requirement, right? So what does the idea of the Bible alone or the Scripture alone or sola scriptura imply? Well, Seventh-day Adventists have also held strictly to the idea that the Scriptures alone are our basis for faith and practice. This does not mean that we deny religious experience, human reason, or correct tradition. However, these must be subservient to the Bible itself. Often we may find that considering other sources such as lexicons, dictionaries, concordances, or other books about the scriptures may help us understand the scriptures. That's great. However, the scriptures themselves must ultimately serve as top priority. And finally, if there appears to be a conflict, the scriptures must ultimately give us the final answer. So we can close down and go home now. We made that kind of a statement, right? Okay, no, we're not going to do that yet. There's other things to say. Dennis? Yes, this is uh, Martha, uh, Martin Luther in Luther's Works, Volume 2, and it's quoted in the Adult Bible School uh, Bible Study Guide uh, for Sunday, April 26. Scripture alone is the true Lord and Master of all writings and doctrine on earth. That's pretty succinct, isn't it? Can you think of any of an experience from a biblical story, since we're emphasizing the biblical story, that illustrates what we are suggesting? Jackie? This is Acts 17, verse 10 and 11. As soon as night came, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue. The people there were more open-minded than the people in Thessalonica. They listened to the message with great eagerness, and every day they studied the scriptures to see if what Paul said was really true. Now, I always, there's always a question in my mind when I, when I read that. Did they have access to the scriptures? How much of the scriptures did they have access to? And, and I mean, were there synagogues already in, in Berea that had scriptures that everybody could go and look at? And if they had scriptures, they would have been in Hebrew. How many people could read Hebrew? So, um, well, they wouldn't have to be. I guess Paul could have, could have been quoting Septuagint, so maybe they had Greek versions. That's always the thing that puzzled me. <clears throat> anyway, go ahead. And then this is a quote from the Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. What we, believers, what we believe in matters of faith is true only if our beliefs correspond to the witness of the whole of Scripture. To all of Scripture, tota scriptura, 
This precept implies the unity of Scripture and the premise that the Bible is sufficiently clear in what it states. So let's think about that for a moment. We're saying that you can look at all of Scripture and you can compare it and you can come up with a consistent picture because of what? It has a, ultimately has a single yeah, it author. Has, yeah, it has yes. one author. The Holy Spirit is responsible for everything that's in there. And all you have to do is throw in some Apocrypha or some Pseudepigrapha, and you can see, for those of you who know about those things, um, you can see how you can come up with strange ideas. So making the claim that we follow sola scriptura does not mean solo scriptura or unaccompanied scripture. We do not reject all other sources of information that might be helpful. However, the Bible stands above all others. Jim? This is from Ellen White's Great Controversy, page 595, paragraph 1. Great comment. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible, and the Bible only is the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent. The voice of the majority, not one nor all of these, should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. Amen. Okay. Could we, could you out there, support every doctrine that you believe is official part of SDA teaching from the Scripture? That's the challenge we need to think about. Well, one of the verses that's sometimes quoted in this respect from the Bible is found in the very end of the Bible, Revelation 22. Carrie? Yes. I'm reading from the Good News Bible, Revelation 22, 18 to 19. I, John, solemnly warn everyone who hears the prophetic words of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to his or her punishment the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes anything away from the prophetic words of this book, God will take away from them their share of the fruit of the tree of life and of the holy city, which are described in this book. Wow. Can't you just picture God up there with a big stick and boy, he's ready to zap anybody who gets out of line? <laughs> but isn't that the, the that's the book of Revelation, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Yes. That yeah. doesn't mean it's the rest of the Bible. Well. I mean, that depends on once. I, I found, there's a text here in Isaiah, if we can take O Lord, why dost thou make us err from your ways and harden our hearts? That happens to be the RSV, which is and the King James and our, many of them are all the same way. The other translation says, why do you permit us to wander away from you? Mm -hmm. See, it's a, a, it's a different yeah. point of view, and well, I like the latter better yeah. than the traditional yeah, We'll be talking about that very, very important point pretty soon. <clears throat> well, this is true about the book of Revelation, well, I would say it's true of all the Bible, but these words were originally written with respect to the book of Revelation specifically. So John had that scroll rolled out there, and at the end he's writing these words down, and he's saying, this is what I saw in vision, and I did my best to write it down in the words, the best words I could, and let me tell you, this is the word of God, it came from God, if you reject it, what are you doing? Rejecting God. You're rejecting God because you're saying your ideas, wherever they came from, are superior to the scriptures. That's a pretty strong yes. statement. Well, this, uh, why is it so serious to add or subtract something from scripture? If we choose to add or to subtract anything from scripture, we are saying that some other authority, sometimes it's ourselves, has overruled scripture. So what are the implications of saying the Bible and the Bible alone. And here's a text from 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Above all else, however, 
remember that no one can explain by him or herself a prophecy in the scriptures. For no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. This is from the Good News Bible. So now, what's Peter saying to us there? What the biblical authors have written down ultimately comes from oh, God, God himself. Yeah. So what would happen if the scripture were not consistent and did not have a single author? In double quotes there. It would not be possible to compare scripture with scripture in support of doctrine. The Bible would become a disparate, confusing collection by different authors with different perspectives and with different ideas. It is only possible for the scriptures to function as a theological guide and norm for our beliefs because of the internal unity of the Bible. That unity is not something superimposed on scripture, but rather it flows out of its coming from a single author, the Holy Spirit. So that's the basic premise of that point we're trying to make. And that's exactly what the naturalistic interpreters say the Bible is. It's, you can't yeah. take somebody from here and compare them to over here because they, they were in different places, they had different yeah. culture, cultural things, and, and so everything you read there, if you uh, looked at uh, some of the natural cri uh, criticism, that's exactly what they say, because they don't see the Holy Spirit. They eliminate the, the supernatural element. I mean, think about it. You have Moses, 1400 years before Christ, all the way down, you got people writing 100 years after Christ. We got 1500 years, different cultures, different languages. You know, how could they possibly be consistent? Well, of course, God is behind it. Yeah. So this is, de this is demonstrated by the fact that repeatedly New Testament authors quoted from the Old Testament, sometimes at length, treating the words as if they were authoritative. Now one of the obvious selections that proves that is Romans 3, 10 through 18. And I'm going to take a moment just to look at that very quickly. As the scriptures say, and I'm pretty sure Paul was quoting me from memory when he, when he did this, there is no one who is righteous, no one who is wise or who worships God. All have turned away from God. They have all gone, gone wrong. No one does what's right, what is right, not even one. Their words are full of deadly deceit. Wicked lies roll off their tongues and dangerous threats like snakes poison from the, their lips. Their speech is filled with bitter curses. They are quick to hurt and kill. They leave ruin and destruction wherever they go. They have not known uh, the path of peace nor have they learned uh, reverence for God. And if we had a lot of time, uh, I'll just pick a couple of them. Look at Ecclesiastes 7 10. There is no one on earth who does what is right all the time and never makes a mistake. So you can see that he's just, he just picked a verse here and a verse there and a verse there and a verse there and he put it all together in one paragraph. Well, what does that imply? And those original verses came from several different authors at very different times. So are they consistent? Yeah, and they all said the same yes. thing, yeah. <clears throat> so Paul is saying, you can pick what you want so long as you pick it from the, from, from the Bible, and if you understand it correctly, it will, it will be consistent. Many Christians in our day believe that they should show regard to and are responsible only for the teachings of the New Testament. They believe that the tenor and ideas of the Old Testament are fierce and destructive and harsh and even unfriendly. But those who really believe in sola scriptura hold that the New Testament is an unfolding of the teachings of the Old Testament. The New Testament and the Old Testament fit together like a single book with no contradictions throughout. This was a major battle in the early years after the destruction of Jerusalem. Many people do not realize this. To the Jews living outside of Palestine, who no longer spoke and read Hebrew, the Greek language scriptures of the Old Testament, known as the Septuagint, were their national history. So, how are they looking at this? This is the history of our people. This belongs to us, right? They claim the right to interpret those in scriptures, interpret those in scriptures according to their understanding and needs. By contrast, the scriptures according uh, by contrast, the early Christians 
felt that the Old Testament should be interpreted in light of the New Testament, and in fact that those two testaments were part of a total package and never, never should be studied alone. Well, you could guess this led to almost a knockdown, dragout fight between, and I guess we're fortunate, although I certainly like, don't like to discredit the, the Jews, we're fortunate that the, the number of, because the Jews have been scattered because of destruction of Jerusalem and the takedown of the whole country, there were not many of them here and there, and even among them, very few of them could read the original Hebrew and so forth. By contrast, the, script, the, the Christian church was just exploding and growing. Pretty, it wasn't too long before it was the official religion of the Roman Empire. So obviously, the, the Jews were losing their, their control of the scriptures, the Old Testament. We're talking about just the Old Testament now. And the Christians were taking it over more and more. And uh, what the Jews did finally is said, well, okay, just take your Greek Bible. We'll go back to our Hebrew because you don't know how to speak Hebrew anyway. We'll go back to Hebrew. It's more reliable. It's da 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 da, and we'll 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 rely on that. And so they, of course, came up with the um, very strict. People copied that and so forth, and preserved it, and had all those rules very carefully because their one claim to fame after Jerusalem was destroyed and their, they were run out of their country was, we have the scriptures. We have the Old Testament. That is the 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 Hebrew Bible. Well, so what do we do with texts that, which appear to be in contradiction to each other? Well, first we look, look more yeah. carefully. That's a great idea. <laughs> when Instead they of seem, jumping to conclusion. Yeah, when they seem to contradict, is it a challenge for us to consider all of the texts in Scripture that bear on the same topic? We will surely find that there is a consistency in the whole. There will, of course, always be texts that we cannot fully comprehend until we get into the better land. But this should not discourage us from doing our best to bring, out, bring all of the appropriate scripture together. My Good News Bible that I love, uh, they had a huge committee of people coming from all different churches to did, to did that translation. And they're honest enough so that fairly often, especially in the Old Testament, they would just say, Here's our translation, and there's a little, little, a little note there and says, we don't know for sure what this means, this verse means. And they're just honest. We're not sure what this, word, this verse means. And you go back and look at it in the Hebrew, and even if you, you don't know anything about Hebrew, it's, you're sure there was an idiom used or something there that we have no idea about. So it's a, it's a challenge for translating Scripture. It should be obvious that if we are encouraged to compare Scripture with Scripture, the Scriptures must be in harmony with each other. If there is no unity in Scripture, it would be not, be not be safe to do so. This again has enormous implications for our study of Scripture, which is the basis for our theology. In the minds of some of us, the most compelling reason for believing that there is no important difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the statements of Jesus and Paul. Remember what they said? Let's take Jesus, for example. Jesus' most famous statement regarding the greatest commandment is found in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Comes straight out of the books of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18, and Deuteronomy. Verse, and let me, I'm just, since you, probably most of you are familiar with what it says in Matthew 22, I'm going to read to you Leviticus 19, 18. So you just get an idea here. Give me a second to get there with my... Well... Okay. So remember it says the, the two commandments are put God first and put your neighbors as yourself. Do not take revenge on anyone or continue to hate him, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. I am the Lord. Jesus quoted that directly. And then we go to Deuteronomy. Um, chapter 6, verse 5. Okay.
Okay, you can do that. This is not difficult. <laughs> you want me to read it? Yeah, go ahead. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Very good. So there's the two verses. Jesus just plain straight quartered them out of the Old Testament, talking about those two great commandments. Furthermore, both Jesus and Paul made it very clear that Jesus Christ was what? The God of the Old Testament. Tim? John 5, 39. You study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And these very scriptures speak about me. Good news, Bible. Luke 24, 27, and 44 to 45. And Jesus explained to them what was excuse me, explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. <clears throat> Imagine someone standing up and saying, this whole Bible that you have in your hand or that you have studied through years and years, it's about me. And think about how they regarded the scriptures and so forth. I mean, how would you respond? I mean, yeah, you know he's a very special guy, but, you know, that's a pretty astounding claim, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's about me. The Old Old Testament, it's about me. Okay, Jim. Then he said to them, These are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms, had to come true. I'm going to interrupt again for a second. When he says, The Law of Moses... What section of the Bible is that? Pentateuch. The five books of Moses, right? Mm -hmm. The writings of the prophets. Now, the Hebrews divide up the Old Testament a little differently than we do, but the prophets starts out with uh, uh, Joshua, Judges, and so forth. Some of the historical books they consider to be prophets, and then the major prophets. But then the Psalms, when it says the Psalms, it doesn't mean just the book of Psalms. It means all those uh, what poetic kind of books, and, and, and that, would, that would be Job and Esther and Psalms and, 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 and many of the minor prophets, all are in that section. So Jesus is saying, I want you to understand that every single section of the Bible, they all, he, he was already aware that there were these three sections of people, because people have argued about that. See, maybe we could throw out part of it and keep part of it. No, Jesus is already saying, you want to read about me? You have to read the entire Old Testament. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And then verse 45, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Good, also from the Good News Bible. So he's saying, it's about me, folks. Read it and figure out what it says about me. And the next text is 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. I want to read... I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. Good, also the Good News Bible. So let's think about that for a moment. What's he trying to say here? Where did Paul get the information that the whole Old Testament, I mean, Paul was a, was a scholar, an expert in the Old Testament. No question about it. He probably had the Old Testament memorized in Hebrew and probably a lot of it in Greek as well. So here he is saying it's all about Christ that he had never met. And he only, you know, he had some information because he had actually talked to the other apostles and so forth. But that's an astounding statement. Uh, why, why do you think Paul would make such a statement? Maybe because it's true? Well, he did have to say, he <laughs> yeah, studied he several make, years yeah. before yeah. he went out and started to do his preaching. And yeah, went into was, Arabia. Yeah. 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 So he was, he was a good student, a good scholar. And probably was a good scholar prior to that, but it was, yeah. and that's why they made him a what a, 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 a member of the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. So yeah. uh, he was no slouch. No. 
But any appeal to the scriptures alone would make no sense if it was impossible for us to understand the basic meanings of those scriptures. So have any of you ever read any passages from scripture that you had a hard time understanding? All the All time. The time. <laughs> okay. Oh, really? You too? <laughs> Well, if you understood it all, then you, uh, you could read it through, you know, like somebody who said, well, I've read it all and I don't yeah. need to read it again. And I, it's like, really? You know, yeah, exactly. And, but there are people who approach things that way, you know, that uh, okay, yet so we go back and o over it again and there are th there's always something new. Jesus repeatedly, many, many times said, look at the Old Testament. Learn what you can from there. Let me just pick a few of those places. Matthew 21, I'm going to read verse 15 and verse 42. The chief priests and the teachers of the law became angry when they saw the wrongful, I'm sorry, the wonderful things he was doing and the children shouting in the temple, praise to David's son. So Jesus said to them, verse 42, haven't you ever read what the scriptures say? The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. Wow. Think of how they responded to that. And then go back to Matthew 12, verses 3 and 5. Jesus answered, Have you ever read what David did that time when he and his men were hungry? Or have you not read in the law of Moses that every Sabbath the priests in the temple actually break the Sabbath law, yet they're not guilty? So when Jesus needed to prove a point, what did he do? Quoted scripture. Quoted scripture. Mm -hmm. What an amazing thought. Go over to Luke chapter 6, verse 3, just to pick another one. Jesus answered them, haven't you read what David did when he and his men? So Luke gave us the same, the same picture, Thank both of them. You. When considering the clarity of Scripture, which some of us have a little bit of a problem with, it is probably honest to say that the most difficult texts to understand in the Bible are not those that challenge us because of their wording or ideas, because of or because of our limited understanding. The most challenging texts are probably those that we clearly understand, but wish we did not have to follow. Hmm. <laughs> There's an interesting thought. You Do, can see people on both sides of the coin, and they'll find their texts and say, the Bible clearly says this. And then the other side will say, well, this clearly says this. And they say, well, that, that's a difficult text. Yes. <laughs> I'd give you a... a some texts that uh, very, and Ezekiel will say one thing, go to Jeremiah, three texts says just the opposite of what it says in Ezekiel. Uh -huh. and a deep, well, and I pointed out earlier in, uh, in Isaiah uh, 63, 17, one translation says, why do you make us do this? The other one, why did you permit us to do that? Uh -huh. uh, so so it, it depends on the paradigm, the point of view, they've set a theological spectacles that a reader or translator or a scribe has available. And yeah. uh, it, it can be a serious problem. Again, most translations are written from the point of view, God's got a lot of power and he's got a command. Uh -huh. You could read that. It, or instead of a command, it could be a prescription yeah. and so forth. So it's... Uh, so I hope none of you out there and none of us here have ever had the time when uh, we found ourselves reading something in Scripture that pretty clearly tells us we, what we ought to do, but we don't really want to. So we're looking for some other way to interpret the Scripture. Mm. I'll well, have to say, unfortunately, I've seen that far too often. That's what you got with the Mishnah and, and, the, and the Talmudic writings, is because they, they're trying to figure some way around the, the yeah. message. Yeah. Yeah. I like to think of that as the idolatry of personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's a good description. There's a, um, a time, and I, I've forgotten exactly when this came up, but uh, the Jews, of course, were not supposed to eat particularly pig's meat. And in the, in the Hebrew, it says, it suggests about, don't, what is it, something about animals that walk on the ground with, with, without, uh, divided hooves, yeah. woven hooves, so yeah. like that and like this. So one Jew says, well, we can solve that. We'll just have them walk on boards instead of on the ground, so they won't be walking on the ground with cloven 
That sounds Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry, I don't, don't mean to make fun of my Jewish friends. But, yeah, that's, that's the way you can... Years ago, the, the fellow had come back from Israel, and he says, uh, you know, you can only go so far on the Sabbath day. And they had a wire, apparently. Yeah. And he says, well, you can only stray so far from the wire. And the guy said, I can go anywhere. He had pulled out his wallet, and he had a piece of wire in, in, in his wallet, so he can go anywhere. So, so he, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, I think it's in Houston. There's a big Jewish community in Houston, so they have a... A wire, a perimeter. a perimeter stuck around so that the Jews can go anywhere within that area because they're... On, they're, on Sabbath. On Sabbath. Yeah. Oh, my son. Yeah. Okay. Um, this implies something else which is also very controversial. We must not limit ourselves to a version of the Bible that is in a language that we no, no longer use and is often hard to understand for us. The King James Version of the Bible was initially written in the common language of the people of that time and has been updated repeatedly to try to make use of modern language. And a lot of people today will read the King James, what they think is the traditional King James, which is probably the 1881 revision, which is the third or fourth revision of the King James, and they think that absolutely they are reading the King James of 1611. They would have a hard time, under. they would find it almost impossible to read the King James of 1611, because of the S's are like F's and all that kind of stuff, you know. It's, it's called black letter. Yeah. And vestiges yeah. of old English. Yeah. And the 1611 Bible had the entire uh, Apocrypha in it, integrated right inside there. And uh, so there's... For those anyway. in Southern California, if you go down to the Huntington yeah. Library, they have one on display there and open to different passages each mm -hmm. time I've been there. But it... You can get a sampling of what it, it's like to try to read that. Yeah. Well, it is a great improvement, these modern language versions, over the original 1611 edition of the King James Version for someone living in the 21st century. But we should also feel free to use translations produced by scholarly groups for modern readers. There are many of the, those available. And if you want to sympathize with the translators of 1611, Look up some time, the, there's about a 15-page introduction to the King James Version, the original King James Version, entitled, From the Translators to the Reader. It's amazing hmm. what they had to say about their translation. From the Translators to the Reader. And uh, it would throw a lot of light on the King James for a lot of people. But in the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church claimed to have an ecclesiastical magisterium which provided the correct understanding of the Bible. So they, they couldn't make any mistakes. They had the right answers. This meant that only the priests were the ones allowed to interpret Scripture according to their own ideas instead of making the Bible subject to the reading and understanding of ordinary people. So guess why you need a monk by the name of Luther to discover what the Bible really says? Yeah. He has access to it. And yeah. he's taught how to read it in the original languages. And so guess what that does? It puts them on an equal, equal ground. You can't say, you don't know. Oh, yes, I do. I can read it in the original language. Thus, Protestants began to speak of the priesthood of all believers. What does that mean? That you can make decisions for yourself as you read yeah. God's Word. You have just as much right to interpret the Scriptures as the priest does. Yeah. Was it was it in Exodus nineteen five or the kingdom of of priests? Uh, got some, well the, the children of Israel. And, and you could apply that to, down to our age. Uh, uh, everybody be informed. Yeah. Okay. It has been aptly pointed out that, and this is from Ellen White. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This is from a Seventh Day Adventist theological handbook. The consistent example of the Bible writer shows that the scriptures are to be taken in their plain, literal sense unless a clear and obvious figure is intended. There is no stripping away of the husk of the literal sense in order to arrive at the kernel of a mystical, hidden, allegorical meaning that only in the, the initiated can uncover. So you can imagine, you can see how uh, the, the ruling church back in the Middle Ages could say, no, it, you, even if you think you can read it, that's not what it means. We have stripped away all the bad stuff and 
this is the kernel, this is the real yeah, point here. And yeah. So, I mean, what, how could you respond? If you were an ordinary person, you were stuck. Yeah. Quite often the Bibles were chained to the church and yeah. the preachers. Yeah. Yes. Another implication that is important, that it is important to recognize from what we have said so far is that scriptures interpret other scriptures. It is often surprising and amazing to study in some depth, depth a passage which may seem difficult to understand by comparing it with other similar passages. Often beautiful new truths become apparent. Dennis? Romans uh, 15.4 in the Good News Bible. Everything written in the scriptures was written to teach us in order that we might have hope through the patience and encouragement which the scriptures give us. And then Ellen White from the book Education 190, uh, paragraph 2. The Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with scripture. The students should learn to view the word as a whole and see the relation, relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme, of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy, and of the work of redemption. Now I have a question for you. Where did Seventh-day Adventists pick up the idea of a great controversy? March 25, 1858, Ellen White's vision. Mm -hmm. Why did we need a vision from God to Ellen White to see the great controversy in Scripture? Well, traditional, that was not traditional teaching. They, they, people hop, skip, they have their collection of littles, and that wasn't part of it, but which is probably the most important little, uh, from my point of view, the great controversy is what makes the Bible understandable. Yeah, it's a, it's a theme right through the Bible. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a whole handout on, in fact, you can find it on our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. The great controversy in Scripture. It's there. I mean, no one in the, in the Protestant Reformation, all those scholars, no one came up with it. Why? Why not? Nobody till at this day and age, outside yeah. of, uh, yeah. uh, among Adventists. Even and, among and if, Adventists, it's limited. It, there's a lot of them, Adventists that have gone out because they, they, it doesn't make sense to them. Yeah. Well, there's some that accuse her of stealing it from uh, Paradise Lost. Uh, although oh. I haven't uh, read them, I've only read just a very smattering of Paradise Lost. But there is... Well, recounts the battle between Christ and Satan in a sense, but not as. Uh, well, you, 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 if you read Revelation, it talks about a battle, and you go back to Genesis, and it talks about you know what happened in the Garden of Eden, and so there's a lot of people. Job. A lot of people have the idea that there's, I mean, all you have to do is be alive for a little while, and you realize there's a conflict between good and evil. But to understand that there's a great controversy over God's character and government and that mm -hmm. Satan has made all these accusations against God and so forth, nobody else has it. The well, substance rather than just the conflict. Yeah. Take Romans 3, 4. How yeah. many mistranslations are of, of that text? Uh, yeah. the, uh, and 3.25. Well, particularly, yeah. 3, practically all uh, translations mistranslate that one in 3.25. But Romans 3, 4, yeah. the NIB says... May you prevail when you judge. Yeah. The um, tradition, I mean, the way the Greek reads, may you win your case when you are judged. Yeah. Or, so it's just the opposite. Yeah. Wow. It would be wonderful if we were all scholars of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Now, how many sections of Aramaic are there in the Bible? The main language of the Old Testament is clearly Hebrew. The language of the New Testament is Koine Greek. Where does the Aramaic come in? Well, Daniel, Daniel has some Aramaic. The central portion of, of Daniel, where he's dealing with the Babylonian rulers and so forth, from Daniel 2, verse 4, to the end of chapter 7, that's all in Aramaic. What else? Ezra and Nehemiah, somewhere in okay. there. Okay, uh, portions, particularly the letters that are written to the, to the um, uh, um, emperors in those days and so forth. And then... Um, there's smatterings here and there, but those are the main sections. Mm -hmm. 
there's someone, yeah, an Esther you mentioned. It would be wonderful if we were all scholars of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek and could study the Bible in its original languages. But fortunately, even online, for those who have computers available and connect, connect online, it is often possible to see what the original words were. Of course, um, it's one thing to see them, and it's especially in the original language, it's one, something else to be able to read them. This is often helpful, and there are so many ways, so many helps available today. However, we must be careful in trying to use such helps and then interpreting Scripture as if we did understand the original languages fully. It's like you read a sentence from another language, and you pick out two or three words, and, oh, I know what that word means, and I know what that word means, and then, do you know, do you know what the whole sentence means? Yeah. No. Probably not. So well, you have to be careful. I, I found out with the, uh, inter, excuse me, the uh, online Bibles that you can get for free in your phone. Yeah. Sometimes they'll have, have one Hebrew word, and you'll end up with uh, as many as eight words in English come out of that one Hebrew word, which is, you know, there's a lot of... Yeah. <laughs> and part of that, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but part of the reason for that is ancient Hebrew, at least what we have preserved of it, is has a pretty limited vocabulary. So you, each word has to portray more than one idea often. So we shouldn't be too surprised at that. So picking just one or two passages from Scripture to support some teaching without considering what the rest of Scripture says on the subject is fraught with real danger. Can I pick an example? The famous evangelist Billy Graham, God bless him, loved to use the story of the rich man and Lazarus to talk about the nature of man and the state of the dead. Let me just read a few verses out of that. There was once a rich man, this is Luke 16, starting with verse 19. There was once a rich man who dressed in the most expensive clothes and lived in great luxury every day. There was also a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. And uh, why do you suppose this man was named Lazarus? We don't know, don't know. where this exact detail came from. For, but there, this, there's a story like this that came out of ancient Egypt. So this is a story that people, something like this story people knew about. But it's interesting that this Lazarus dies and goes somewhere, and a short time later, Jesus is raising someone from the dead whose name is Lazarus. Lazarus. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder if that was intentional. Covered with sores who used to be brought to the rich man's door, hoping to eat the bits of food that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. Yuck. The poor man died and was carried to by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the feast in heaven. The rich man died and was buried. And in the Hades, where he was in great pain, uh, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. And by the way, uh, if you look at even our, our Bible here, uh, Hades is just simply the world of the dead. The little note is right there. So he called out, Father Abraham! Take pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue because I'm in great pain in this fire. But Abraham said, Remember, my son, that in your lifetime you were given all the good things. Well, Lazarus got all the bad things. But now he's enjoying himself here while you're in pain. Besides all that, there is a deep pit lying between us so that those who want to cross over from here to you cannot do so, nor can anyone cross over to us from where you are. What happened to God's omnipresence? Hmm. The rich man said, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send, send Lazarus to my father's house, where I have five brothers. Let him go and warn them so that they at least will not come to this place of pain. Abraham said, Your brothers have Moses and the prophets to warn them. Your brothers should listen to what they say. The rich man answered, That is not enough, Father Abraham. By the way, you know, we can't cross over this great pit, but we can talk back and forth across this pit. <laughs> There's a whole lot of funny things about this story. If someone would rise from death and go to them, then they would turn from their sins. But Abraham said, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone were to rise from death. And what happened when Lazarus was raised from the dead? Did they're it convince everybody? Yeah, they're not, they're still they were body. still just as, maybe more so. Set in their opinion. I mean, think about the Sadducees who didn't believe it was possible for someone to rise from the dead. 
What do you do? Well, here's a man walking around that's just in direct, you know. Yeah. And no, everybody, was, a lot of people were there. They saw him. He was dead four days. They used no, you can't argue about the fact that this guy was dead. And here he is walking around. What do you say? Well, <laughs> a short time later, you know, the, the, uh, well, the, the rich man says, uh, you know, uh, if you send my brother, warn my brothers, and, yeah. and, and they'll do what was right. Well, anyway, even if they'll, somebody were to come from the dead, they, they wouldn't believe it. And, of course, then you have the actual story of Lazarus, mm -hmm. where when Lazarus was raised back to life, and they plotted to kill him. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it had no salutary effect upon on the religious leaders. All they did is make him more angry. Now, Jesus' resurrection... You see the same thing. What an amazing thing with all those witnesses. And still, there said, be quiet, don't yeah. tell anyone. Yeah. By the authorities. <laughs> I'm sure they couldn't they follow were, through I with mean, that. But. <laughs> Ellen White tells us that Lazarus and Mary and Martha were a nephew and nieces of Simon. Mm -hmm. Simon was a Pharisee. That kind of inheritance was very often passed down from children from parents to children. We don't know what happened to Simon, I mean, to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus's parents. It's very likely that they were also Pharisees. We were so, discussing this this afternoon. Was Lazarus the oldest of, of, the, three, of, the, three? of the three siblings? Yeah, we don't we, know. Scripture doesn't know. tell us. No, uh, we don't know. But I'm sure that when, when I mean, Simon was there, I'm sure there, that place was probably full of Sadducees and Pharisees because here was one of the you know, up-and-coming people of the, of the community that died. Well, this brings us to a very important point for Seventh-day Adventists. How should we relate to the writings of Ellen White? For those who have made themselves somewhat familiar with her writings, it is very clear that she felt that the Bible is foundational and central to our teachings and doctrines and to her thoughts and theology. And we've already looked at one of her passages about that. But, Jackie, I think you have something more on this that. This is Ellen G. White from The Great Controversy. For 6,000 years, that mastermind Satan that once was highest among the angels of God has been wholly bent to the work of deception and ruin. Can I interrupt there for a second? Mm -hmm. Try to imagine yourself in Satan's place. He remembers distinctly exactly what it was like when he was in heaven. Oh, he, sure. he, was, he was the prime minister, almost, if you will, of heaven. The leader of the angels who went like this. And now he's spending thousands of years doing everything he can to destroy that kingdom that he used to be the, the lead of. What, what, what in the... I mean, that must be insanity. Mm -hmm. How can you that's, describe that's that? It's so hard to understand. Yeah. It, How yeah. could that happen? We just, that's a mystery. The mystery of iniquity. It is. Yeah, it is. Exactly. Go ahead. And all the depths of satanic skill and subtility acquired, all the cruelty developed during these struggles of the ages will be brought to bear against God's people in the final conflict. Okay, what does that tell you? How much practice has Satan had? A long time. Mm -hmm. Thousands of years, at least 6,000, maybe more. A lot of time practicing. And he's going to bring everything, every bit of that skill that he has against God's people in the final conflict. It's and scary. In, and in this time of peril, the followers of Christ are to bear to the world the warning of the Lord's second advent, and a people are to be prepared to stand before him at his coming, without spot and blameless. At this time, the special endowment of divine grace and power is not less needful to the church than in the apostolic days. Wow. I mean, if Satan's going to come at us with his... See, Satan knows that if... If a group of people hang together and stick faithful to God's cause, it's curtains for him. So the only way he can go on living is delay that happening. Wow. Okay. 
In her writings, Ellen White repeatedly pointed people back to the scriptures. From Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, 605, you are not familiar with the scriptures. He if, was writing, of course, to some individuals. If you had made God's Word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain toward Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimonies. It is because you have neglected to acquaint yourself with God's inspired book that he has sought to reach you by simple, direct testimonies. Pretty so, interesting statement, isn't it? It is. Yeah. What does that say to us? It says God doesn't give up. Yep. Even when you're dense. Exactly. Exactly. And, I mean, what would she say to our church today? I mean, when she was talking here, people in the evenings, there was no television, there was no radio. She could sit, she, people would sit down in, in, in their families and discuss the Bible at length. Yeah. And where are we today? Hmm. It's often rather difficult to find somebody that enjoys talking about Scripture. Yep. A friend of mine today, I gave him, by the way, a copy of uh, the Good News. Mm -hmm. He's used to the New it, what, what, Jehovah's Witness. Oh yeah. He got their own translation, yeah. and he gave the New me World. A, yeah, New, New World translation. He gave me a copy that he had doubles of. So he said one day, "What translation do you use?" And I said, "Well, we use several different." translations and I said would you like to have a copy of the Good News Bible and I looked in the fly lip and I, I 20 years ago in 1999 your class over at the, mm -hmm. the when you recommended that and you got a, several of them for us mm -hmm. and I had wrote a note in there and then I wrote him a note mm -hmm. because he said I'd like to read it other translations yeah so it was pretty interesting very good very good it's wonderful to have an opportunity to run across someone like that. Yeah, we, we talked about the idea that it's so hard to talk to even your fellow believers. That they look at like One guy said to me, Jim, don't you know what you really believe? <laughs> like he didn't enjoy talking about it. Yeah. Uh, well, Seventh-day Adventists have been incredibly blessed. No other group in history has had inspired records so complete and so readily accessible as we have. What are we doing with all that treasure? Gary? The student of the Bible should be taught to approach it in the spirit of a learner. We are to search its pages, not for proof to sustain our opinions, but in order to know what God says. A true knowledge of the Bible can be gained only through the aid of that spirit by whom the word was given. And in order to gain this knowledge, we must live by it. All that God's words command, we are to obey. The study of the Bible demands our most diligent effort and persevering thought. As the miner digs for the golden treasure in the earth, so earnestly, persistently must we seek for the treasure of God's word. Amen. It came from Education, page 189, paragraphs 1 to 3. When you make the Bible your food, your meat, and your drink, when you make its principles the elements of your character, you will know better how to receive counsel from God. I exalt the precious word before you today. Do not repeat what I have said, saying, Sister White said this and Sister White said that. Find out what the Lord God of Israel says and then do what he commands. That's from Selected <laughs> Messages. <laughs> That's no not beating around the bush, is it? Yeah. On the line. Yeah. Good. Many of our Christian friends believe in doctrines which we know are not based on all of Scripture. For example, the belief in the immortality of the soul and the belief in the sacredness of Sunday. As Seventh day Adventists, are we prepared to give a clear Bible based explanation of our teachings on those subjects? Can we do it in a kind and considerate way and not a rough accusing way? Finally, how should we feel about people who read a certain passage in Scripture or perhaps several passages and believe they have discovered some grand new truth? Margaret? God has not passed his people by and chosen one solitary man here and another there as the only ones worthy to be entrusted with his truth. 
He does not give one man new light contrary to the established faith of the body. Let none be self-confident as though God had given them special light above their brethren. One accepts some new and original idea which does not seem to conflict with the truth. He dwells upon it until it seems to him to be clothed with beauty and importance, for Satan has power to give this false appearance. Wow. At last it becomes the all-absorbing theme, the one great point around which everything centers, and the truth is uprooted from the heart. I warn you to beware of these side issues, whose tendency is to, div is to divert the mind from the truth. Error is never harmless. It never sanctifies, but always brings confusion and dissension. This is Ellen G. White from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. Any of you had the experience of coming in contact with somebody who's stuck on a certain idea and they've gotten it out of two or three places in Scripture, and boy, this is, you know, we just need to tell the whole church because this is the truth, and whew, I can remember that even from my childhood. Yeah. I remember shepherd's rods at yeah. camp meeting. Oh yes, we had every in year. Australia too. Yeah. Yeah, we had we had missionary friends that we we worked with in Africa, and the husband was very faithful Seventh Day Adventist, and all of a sudden the wife decided that she would get off in one of these. It was a thing related to shepherd's rod, and yeah. it really didn't matter what you said to her. She she knew what she knew and. What what do you do in a case like that? You, you 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 you're sad. You just well, it's clear that this lesson has some absolutely essential and important ideas that we must co incorporate into our thinking and practice. Are we doing that? Think about the ideas we've covered in this lesson. That the Bible, all the way through from beginning to end, has a single author. You can quote. Pieces from the, in fact, it's, it, it gives even more strength to your, what you're reading if you can find stuff from all the way through in different parts of the scripture that support the same truth. Uh, instead of, you know, if, if you find someone that all they can focus on is the book of Daniel, all they can focus is on some other, well, maybe the book of Revelation. Adventists tend to focus on those kinds of things and other parts of scripture. We can't, we can't let that just completely control our lives. We have to take the whole thing from beginning to end. Our wonderful Father, we thank you so much for these lessons which touch on some pretty tender points, but are so important in our understanding of our doctrines, of our beliefs, and how, we, uh, have, how these have been established, and what they can mean to us. We are so thankful for all the help you've given us we know that we need to be taking advantage of every bit of it because the Satan is going to come in the last days and he is going to attack us from every side that he can possibly imagine. Help us to be prepared for that and not to be moved by his activities is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.